RK. Do you prefer RK or do you prefer Ryan? RK. The the I'm trying to bury the Ryan. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> then we'll never say we'll never say Voldemort's name again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Al already my favorite interview of the day. <laughs> oh, RK, it's so such an honor to speak with you today. Uh, what an incredible journey you have been on in your life. And now we get to talk about it with your new book, The Yards Between Us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Yes, The Yards Between Us has, you know, the story of your life is not a story that you think about telling or what what parts do I put in? What 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 is the overall message? Um, It's a therapeutic journey. It's the hardest thing yeah. I've ever done in my life, including playing in the NFL. Um, But I'm so proud to have it out. I hope that someone can read it and see themselves. I hope that someone can read it and and see an experience that they never even thought of and feel connected to as on a human level. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it creates empathy and hope for those that need it. So thank you for having me. Thank you for, for talking about the book. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's, let's kind of start at the beginning. What was little RK like? Oh my gosh. What was little RK like? Uh, <laughs> Cute, cute, cute as hell. Of course, uh -oh. well duh. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was introverted. He was he was a good kid that loved his mom. He was a bit quiet. Um, and I think he was trying to just he was observant. He was trying to see people and learn things. And and I think what he didn't realize was he's trying to see himself and mm -hmm. see where he fit. Um, but cute, cute as a button. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. I mean, look at you now. It's very, very handsome as a button now. I, actually, I guess you're handsome as a zipper. I don't know. What's the upgrade from a button? <laughs> <laughs> so when did you know you wanted to play football? Oh, my gosh. Um, grade school, I guess. I, I really didn't know until it was happening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the crazy thing with, with football, specifically in Texas, I talk about Texas in the three Fs, family, faith, and football. Um and it's probably not even that order. It's probably football, faith, family, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so I was just walking the halls as a normal um, 13, 14 year old boy would that was six foot um, and very lanky and, and all these things. And the coaches were literally following, you know, turning their head when I walked the corner, um, following me and asking me, uh, cause football is a class there. So everyone knew that I didn't have football on my schedule. And the coaches yeah. were wondering why not. Um, so I I was also never, <laughs> you know, it's it's scary as a young black man in Texas when when older white men are chasing you. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I I was a little ups, I was a little worried. But then when I found that the cause or the reason was for something positive and something that they really saw potential in me and they really felt invested and connected um, to me in 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 these small moments and also you know in speaking with me and seeing that. I was someone who had a good head on his shoulders. I, I felt encouraged to then lean in and see what it was all about. Once I got in there, I, I met the players and the teammates um, who instantly became like brothers to me. Uh, I, I found mentors and father figures in, in coaches that I hadn't had because I lost a stepfather young and my biological father wasn't in my life at that time. Um, it, it felt like it was also giving me all the things that I, I was looking for that we talk about that little RK was, was trying to find without even knowing. And then I had success <laughs> and I happened to be yes, talented and, 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 and it's always good as a young person, regardless of whether it's for your academics, whether it's for your sports or your club or your interests, it's, it's always um, needed to be validated and to be seen and to be appreciated um, and for people to encourage you to do the things that you, that you love to do and that you want to do. Um, and I got that from football. So it really was checking a lot of the boxes for me. I think I mm -hmm. came back and told my mom that I love football and that I wanted to play. And she said that she'd never seen me um, like that, that she knew instantly that I had found my first love and that it was football. Wow. That's really special. And then of course the dream comes true. You get drafted by the Cowboys, which is like, you know, one of the teams and all of the, I have to say that as a diehard Seahawks fan, because of my location, I still have to say Dallas football is pretty doggone amazing. So <laughs> It is the Seahawks. I love the Seahawks. They, they hold a special place in my heart um, because I believe Russell Wilson was my first NFL sack when, when he played for the Seahawks. So was love he Seattle. Really? He was. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> that's hilarious. Boo. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> 
Wow. Wow. So what was it like getting that call from Dallas of like, yeah, you're going to come play with us now? Well, first I thought it was a prank <laughs> or like a joke or that people just forgot the draft was going on, going on because I have a Texas cell phone number. So when I saw a Texas number pop up during the draft, I thought maybe it was like a friend or, you know, an old high school buddy. So I was a little hesitant to answer, but I was like, let me just answer and hang up so I can I can get back to the draft. And when Jerry Jones, like thick Southern draw, is like saying my name on the phone, I'm instantly, once again, like this is a joke. <laughs> uh, but you know, it it was, it was overwhelming. I'd also been waiting at that point. I got drafted in the, in the third day. Uh, I think they still do three day format. I got drafted in the third day. Um, so I was also a little restless and a little like anxious of, will I get drafted? Will I get drafted? Will I? So when the hometown team calls and Jerry Jones is saying, mm. asking if you want to be a Dallas Cowboy, uh, you you give him the only answer that you can, which is yes. Uh, so so it, an amazing moment, something that I will always look back at and be proud of um, mm -hmm. and also get a little emotional about because um, it's so many years and a lot of hard work and a lot of blood, sweat and tears goes into that moment. A lot of people don't get that call. Um, so I, I was very fortunate. Yeah, that's a that's a huge blessing and a giant check mark in someone's life. Uh, very, very cool. So what was it like playing in the NFL with what you felt you had to keep as a secret? It was difficult, I would say. I think playing in the NFL base level is difficult <laughs> for That's anyone. Yeah. Um, I The game is physically so demanding, um, yeah. but even more so mentally demanding. One, to get into the mindset of like waking up and pretty much running into a wall every day is is a unique mindset in and of itself. Um, when you add the struggles of being a human being, the struggles that we mm -hmm. all have, whether it be sickness, yeah. family, um, relationship, all these things, difficult, added stress. Um, secret is a special type of weight because mm -hmm. a secret is something that you can never unburden or that you don't, you know, you choose not to unburden um, and it only kind of grows in weight. So I would say playing in the NFL with the secret maybe started out as something doable. That's why I made the decision in the first place. I was like, I can do this. Um, you know, I'll just play my career and then afterwards I'll live my life. Um, and as you, as you realize that life does not pause for football, that um, trauma does not pause for football, that loss and grief, um, depression, anxiety, pain, heartbreak, mm -hmm. do not pause for football. Um, you realize that the decision that you made is kind of eating at you. Um, and, and growing and crushing you. And I got to a point where I was feeling all of those things and still being asked to perform on the highest level in, in the highest league uh, yeah. in the world. So, so it, it was tough. When did you decide to come out? When I decide, I, I went on a, let me think, how do I start? Summer 2019, <laughs> <laughs> I met my, boyfriend and partner Corey who who is still my boyfriend and partner now to this day mm -hmm. so loving uh in that summer I was away from football because I had an injury I just lost my best friend Joe to cancer and was dealing with that grief and I had found happiness in in Los Angeles California with this man um away from all of the things that I thought would be my future away from all these things that I put so much of my identity and my effort into even away from you know hundreds um, of miles away from my family as well. And I still found a way to be happy. I still found a way to 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 smile and laugh and, and feel true, genuine joy. And right at the moment where I thought that life could be doable, um, even without my best friend or even without football, uh, the San Francisco 49ers called and flew me out for a, a tryout that went exceedingly well and i only say that because everyone else in the organization told me that as well um <laughs> and they brought me in because they thought a player's injury um had a significant injury and they would need to replace him towards the end of the workout they found out they got the scans back from the doctor they found out the injury wasn't as serious as they thought so i ended up not signing them with that with them that day but it was once again a moment that should have been one of the joyous moments of my life one of the most exciting and it filled me with anxiety and dread to leave this this new life i had just started cultivating and living behind and to do the same thing I had done before, which is sacrifice it all for football. Uh, I got back to LA and decided that I never wanted to be put in that position to make that decision again, that the next time I was in that position, um, 
all my cards would be on the table, so to speak, and that I would go in there as my full self and say, hey, I'm a I'm a damn good football player. And I'm also all of these other things that make me who I am, um, take it or leave it. And that is when I made the decision to come out. So do you think that your injury was actually looking back always, always a terrible thing to have an injury when you're a football player, any sort of athletic player at all. Um, do you think it was almost a blessing because it allowed you to take that break to actually really connect with who you were? I, I will say that a blessing, definitely, most definitely a blessing. Um, I was in a position where I was not going to focus on me unless I was forced to. And an injury happening is an inevitable part of football. Um, so I can look at that as 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 a blessing in disguise because a lot of the times we are <laughs> we are so dead set on something that is not meant for us or is that not right in that moment or is that is actually causing us harm. And though you know the the forces to be saw it saw it that way for me, that injury would take me away. I can view that as a blessing now. I will say that grief and that loss mm. um, put on top of that was an experience. Once again, that that most of us will face just in losing someone, but that was so foreign, um, and that no one I think was equipped for it and equipped to handle. Um, that really put me in a state of crisis and in a state of trying. Because honestly, to be injured, yeah, I, I could have been injured and I could have had Joe and I could have had my family and I probably would have just rehabbed and still went back to football and still made that sacrifice. Um, so the so the injury alone would was not was not enough to get me to that place. It it, it was. It was honestly being in a vi one of the darkest moments of my life. Mm -hmm. And I write about it and I detail and I keep talking about it now because I don't want anyone to have to get to that place to choose themselves. I don't want anyone to have to get to that place to to find that love for themselves, that respect for themselves or come out. Um, so 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 I want people to read my experience. I want people to go through it via me and my past and realize that, OK, there's a way for me to circumvent this now. There's a way for me to get ahead of this. Um, mm -hmm. So 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 that is my my goal and my hopes with that that part of the book. So RK, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And the the best part about this and your journey and you being so honest and candid and sharing it, which is incredibly scary and you are just incredibly brave for putting it out there, uh, is that it comes during this time of, of when we kind of talk about mental health and how important it is to not be scared and ask for help. So what do you hope people get from this book of yours? And also why now? I hope that people get from the yards between us that we all need help, that there are nearly 8 billion people in this world. And that's not by mistake. That is by design. We are not meant to do anything alone. We are not meant to feel alone or be alone. We are meant to have support and community and love. Uh, and to, to know our place in people's lives and in turn our place in this big, old, scary um, universe. So 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 that is one of the things that I want people to take away, that there is a community out there for you, whether you feel disconnected from it, whether they are in a different location, you just need to get there or you need to bring them to you or you need to connect in any way you see fit. Um, there's community out there for you and that you're not alone. And in terms of mental health and mental wellness and, and really what I just call the human condition, we need to put things in place um, to support that, to support that mental health and that mental wellness. Um, for me, I am an advocate for therapy. I'm still in therapy now. I start therapy um, towards the end of the yards between us. And it's something that has tra transformed my life, but also helped me to maintain uh, a level of joy in my life, a level of, of love. And it gives me the tools to deal with the, the inevitable things that will come up, you know, I cannot say that I came out and life was just perfect because that's a lot. <laughs> I came out and I just I faced different struggles, but I went into them, um, you know, being in a good place with myself and being able to at least be like, OK, I have me kind of under control right now or, or I'm in a good place with me. Now I can take on these things. Um, yeah. Now I can tackle these things. And, and men from a young age, at least when I was growing up, weren't really encouraged to do that. And I think that's changing. And I think that's beautiful. I think that's I think that's necessary because men are humans. You know, I think a lot of the time we think that they're not or we look at them like they're not or they think they're not. Uh, but but we, we are humans and we are not above uh, depression, anxiety, um, all of these things. And we're not above therapy. We're not above working on it and talking about our emotions and being vulnerable. I love that. I think men sometimes are conditioned 
that they're supposed to be the strong ones, the spider killers, the people that can, you know, face everything and fix it. And you just can't maintain, you cannot maintain your life at that level and be happy. <laughs> yeah. And there's nothing, exhausting. Stronger than, there's nothing stronger than being vulnerable as well. Absolutely. As a young man raised also by, by single women and by my mother and, and by my, my grandma and having aunts around and all these incredible women, I saw so much strength in yeah. vulnerability <laughs> and in them being there for each other and in them expressing their feelings and then them tackling things head on and also the duality that women possess to be both um, caregiver and protector, to be both breadwinner and nurturer um, and housekeeper and, you know, all the king builder, all of these things. Um, it, it showed me that, you know, the things that that men are told to be and that men are praised for um, women have been doing and also have been doing all the things that men are afraid to do. Um, and I was like, OK, you know, to be one of these strong macho men is cool. You know, that's the type I want to fit into. But now looking back and I'm like, oh, no, I I learned so much from the women in my life and I grew to be the man that I am today because of those women. And I think that that is something that men also overlook or don't appreciate enough or we don't talk about enough. RK, how can people find your book, The Yards Between Us? The Arts Between Us is available anywhere you buy your books, available online at all the stores. It's in stores as well. I just went over to the Barnes & Noble in Union Square here in New York City to sign a few copies. And you can get The Arts Between Us anywhere you find your books. If you can't find it, um, it's on books.disney.com slash The Arts Between Us, backslash The Arts Between Us. If you're having trouble there, go to my social media. I'm on Instagram and Twitter at RK Relentless. Uh, yeah, The Arts Between Us. <laughs> Where can people find you to like watch you speak? Because you are such a compelling orator. I, I want to hear more from you and to and to absorb more of your wisdom. Well, thank you so much. I, I will say social. I, I update my socials pretty yeah. regularly. Um, Instagram and Twitter at RK Relentless. Um, Google me. Find me. Come reach out to me. Send me a letter. Uh, carrier pigeon, whatever it is, bottle, message in a bottle, wherever you need to be. I try to be as available, as accessible, especially to those who need me or those who need the message or to those who just want a friend um, or someone to talk to or someone to to listen. Uh, I try to be as accessible as possible, but social media will probably be the fastest way. RK, you are a beautiful human. And I mean that in every sense of the word. Uh, you, This has truly been a pleasure to speak with you. And I just continue to pray for your happiness and your health and your journey. And thank you so much for being so candid and vulnerable and open. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It, it really means the world to me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. You take care of yourself. All right. I will. I will. I'm all having right. fun in New York city. <laughs> Good. Well, and watch for the carrier pigeon. Cause I'll be sending one. I'm sure. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'll be looking. All right, sweetheart. Take care. <laughs> thank you. You too. Have a good one. Bye.